Hi, this is John VE6EY in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, with a video about making and ham radio. And specifically in this video, I'm going to take you on a tour of uh, my recent project, which was making a mostly printed and motorized magnetic loop antenna. This has been a lot of fun putting together, designing and uh, making all the parts that I thought would, uh, <coughs> would make this a really interesting project. In the presentation, I'll talk briefly about the two tools I've been using to do a lot of my work. Uh, the first is the 3D printer, and the second is the CNC machine. And then the magnetic loop antenna project uh, will cover the construction of a butterfly capacitor, uh, the construction of the loop, uh, design and implementation of remote control for the loop using wireless, and the loop testing and performance. So here we go. The 3D printer. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I invested $300 in a kit uh, from China called the Sunhoki Prusa i3. Uh, this is a very simple RepRap printer. It uh, is a design called the Bowden extruder, where the uh, uh, filament, the plastic filament, runs through a tube into a hot end and gets printed. And the uh, the machine has worked very well. I've had a few hiccups, had to make a few repairs, but basically it's uh, it's been a good workhorse over the last two years. <clears throat> One of the uh, first additions I made for the 3D printer was buying a $3 sensor um, called uh, an inductive sensor, and I used this for automatic uh, leveling of the bed. When you're doing a 3D print, uh, probably the most critical part is getting the first layer or two layers printed properly. And the key for that is having your nozzle just a very tiny distance above the surface of the print bed. Uh, this auto leveling process works by sensing the aluminum plate that uh, is used as the print bed and automatically adjusting for any difference in leveling across the surface. And it, uh, it works quite well. Not bad for a $3 project. With a 3D printer, you can do tons of things. Uh, I've been printing a lot of replacement parts. A friend of mine had a little plastic piece in his kitchen drawer assembly break on him, and he couldn't buy replacements. So after a bit of design and, uh, and printing, I printed him some replacement parts that are working quite well. Uh, you can print all sorts of things. Uh, when I was making my CNC machine, in addition to printing all of the structural pieces to hold it together out of plastic, I uh, actually printed a cable chain, uh, which works very nicely. A friend of mine recently uh, wanted a project box to contain uh, his Geiger counter that he put together. So it took a few hours, but I was able to print a project box. Um, this one's made out of ABS plastic and uh, took, I think, about three and a half or four hours to print, but at the end of the day it worked quite nicely. The CNC machine. So I've been dreaming about a CNC machine for a long time. CNC means computer numerical control, and uh, while the uh, 3D printer uses something called additive manufacturing, where it adds material layer by layer, the uh, CNC machine is subtractive manufacturing. It mills or cuts material away and leaves you with whatever you've uh, designed to print. I found a, a model that a guy had developed called the Mostly Printed CNC Machine, and uh, you can look this up on the internet. And uh, it had a, a very good performance specs, uh, but it was very cheap. And uh, putting this whole thing together has cost me less than $400. One of the reasons I did a CNC machine was I wanted to be able to mill aluminum plates for a butterfly capacitor for the loop. Quite a few parts went into this. Now, I didn't buy any of the kits. I actually sourced all of the parts myself, uh, mostly from China. I sourced the hardware locally at places like Home Depot and Lowe's and Princess Auto and ordered things like the bearings and motors and uh, power supply uh, from uh, China, so it took a while uh, to arrive. The nice thing about this CNC machine is it uses the same control board that my 3D printer uses, so I was very familiar with the electronics and how to modify the firmware and things like that. 
So getting to work with the models for the parts that were printed on the internet, I actually spent a couple of weeks printing the parts. These are made out of uh, PLA plastic. And uh, as you can see, they uh, are designed to fit around conduit, uh, EMT electrical conduit, which provides the, uh, the X and Y and Z axis uh, for movement on this machine together with the, uh, the bearings. And uh, following that, I began to put it all together on a table in the basement, uh, carefully cutting out the parts and, uh, and putting them together. And you can see that basically the, uh, the surface of the milling machine rolls about on bearings on these uh, stainless steel tubes. And then the vertical part moves up and down uh, also on bearings uh, in, in the middle of the machine. Uh, the size I chose was roughly 18 inches by 24 inches, which I thought was big enough for the kind of things I wanted to do. Uh, hooking up the uh, stepper motors was quite easy. I made some small printed circuit boards to reverse the motor drivers. Uh, basically, the extra axis drivers uh, move together, but one moves in the opposite direction, so you need to uh, reverse the, uh, the, the pins driving the motors. The uh, <coughs> stepper motors were probably the single most expensive part of the CNC machine. The five motors cost me around $100. The machine uses uh, a universal tool holder, uh, which sits on the vertical axis, and you can slide different tools into that holder and uh, fasten them down. One of the nice things I've learned to do with 3D printing is use what's called the captive nut, as you can see in the upper right of that picture. Uh, the nut that uh, the screw goes through is actually captured by the part and holds it in place. and That makes it quite easy to uh, put a lot of things together. For a spindle, a uh, spindle is uh, the part that spins and uh, turns your cutting tool. I just used a cheap uh, rotary tool, a Dremel knockoff from Princess Auto, cost around $40. Uh, but to get it to fit on the machine, I had to uh, customize a holding bracket, which I made out of plastic, and, uh, and that works quite nicely, too. I've been using this uh, uh, Dremel-like tool as my spindle since I started work with this machine. A friend of mine helped me build a table. I should say he built it <laughs> to my specs, um, and uh, I decided to mount the uh, CNC machine in a corner of the garage, uh, and uh, it all began with just putting the frame in place and getting the table leveled. Once I got the whole machine put together, the first cut to uh, prove that it worked was actually a 2D plot. It was a drawing with a pen and paper where I just simply drew some circles and some text just to prove to myself the machine worked. Uh, and once you've actually used it as a printer, then you have a bit of confidence that you know what you're doing. Uh, the second cut was styrofoam block. Um, I designed the uh, plates uh, for my, uh, my capacitor and I used the um, milling machine just to mill the design out of a piece of styrofoam. And here again, this was the first actual solid cut that I'd made and styrofoam is a nice, easy, low risk way of uh, learning to mill with a machine like this. So it uh, finally all got put together. Uh, you can see the uh, 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 tool sitting in the garage. I even 3D printed my own uh, clamps for holding the work down. And, uh, and it works quite nicely. And I've got a little computer in the garage that I use for controlling the machine. And now that's the machine. Let's look at the results of the work. The butterfly capacitor uh, uh, this is a great capacitor to use for uh, for a homemade loop. Um, I decided to try making the plates for this capacitor out of uh, 25,000 of an inch aluminum. And uh, the first time I tried and clamped everything down and started cutting, it uh, kind of jammed and pulled. And I realized I had a problem in that the uh, very thin aluminum uh, was being pulled off the surface of the uh, of the machine by the cutting uh, process, so I knew I would need to uh, figure out some better way of doing it, uh, and that led me to looking in how do I actually tape uh, or glue the, uh, the very thin aluminum down to the surface and still be able to take it out later. 
So I used uh, some masking tape, uh, with, um, basically a masking tape on the uh, four inch square of aluminum and a masking tape on the base. And then I glued those two together. And after I do the milling, I can just uh, basically pull the masking tape off the metal and it, uh, it comes apart very nicely. So here you can see an attempt to uh, bolt down some uh, aluminum plates to the CNC machine and cut the uh, stator and rotor plates uh, for one section of a butterfly capacitor. Took a while to get this right. It's uh, when you're trying to cut through a piece of material 25 thousandths of an inch uh, thick uh, and do it sort of one or two thousandths of an inch at a time. Uh, if your material is not entirely level, you won't get a proper cut all the way around. So in some cases I had to uh, get out a utility knife and just finish the cut manually by uh, by cutting into the uncompleted milling parts and then taking them apart. But eventually I got uh, 10 sections or so cut for my uh, butterfly capacitor. And uh, after doing the milling, I took some files and, uh, and filed the edges down so there were no sharp corners. That went pretty quickly. And then I 3D printed uh, front, back, uh, and uh, basically the, the mount for the uh, capacitor. It's using uh, 10 24th brass rods, uh, nickel plated nuts to space the uh, plates uh, from each other and I've got some plastic nuts in there too and uh, basically it all holds together and this capacitor uh, can uh, this first one I cut the plates were pretty wide widely spaced and I was not getting enough range so I had to move the plates closer together to get more capacitance there's a trade-off when you make these capacitors you need uh, lots of space to handle the voltage but if you have too much space then you don't get enough capacitance so uh, you, you need to find the sweet spot in terms of the distance between the plates and the uh, <clears throat> the axis or the shaft that's holding the uh, rotors is also made from a threaded brass rod sitting inside plastic bushings so it can rotate freely so the hard part was making the uh, uh, butterfly capacitor I then went on to making the loop I thought for my first loop I just used some uh, quarter inch uh, refrigerator tubing that uh, you can buy at the hardware store and I had to figure out a way how to unroll a small loop of uh, quarter inch tubing into a five foot diameter uh, loop and uh, I used my CNC machine to actually mill out an arc in a piece of wood that was the right shape for a five foot diameter circle and I just worked that uh, little jig that um, piece of wood with the groove in it around the uh, copper and used it to shape it into its proper form. I used a 3D printer to make mounting brackets for the top and the bottom of the loop and then I attached some uh, copper strap as a way of connecting the capacitor. And so this is my first attempt with the loop and the capacitor. It's not yet motorized but I could turn it by hand and uh, did some testing and just satisfied myself that I really had a root loop that was resonant at the frequencies that I wanted. To feed the loop uh, you can use either a simple copper wire uh, loop which is what's shown here. The uh, diameter of the feed is one foot versus the five feet for the main loop or you can use a uh, what they call a Faraday loop uh, which is shown at the bottom there not connected but I experimented with both of them until I could find something that uh, that gave me a, a low SWR. Now the remote control this was actually the reason I wanted to make the loop I thought wouldn't it be great if I could just put the loop outside and then I could just push a button in the shack and it would retune uh, but I wanted to do that using a wireless rather than a wired approach so I ordered a couple of really cheap parts. Uh, the first was an Arduino Pro Mini. This is a microcontroller and it costs three dollars and basically it's a computer that you can program to do all sorts of things. I chose this model because it's a 3.3 volt version and I needed compatibility of that level uh, with my wireless card. Um, uh, stepper motor and controller. This little uh, uh, stepper is uh, $3 on eBay. Uh, 
and it's more than powerful enough to uh, turn the capacitor and, uh, and get that whole thing to work and comes with a controller board. And lastly, a Wi-Fi module. This uh, little ESP8266 has been around for about uh, two and a half or three years now. It also costs three dollars. And basically, uh, it's a Wi-Fi connection point. You can actually have your loop show up on your home network, or you can actually create your own access point uh, called loop control or whatever you want to call it and access it with a uh, Wi-Fi computer or a mobile phone or however you want to do it. The 3D printer got called into action again to uh, make some gearing. Uh, I wanted to have very fine tuning. Uh, this stepper motor gave me a 64 to 1 reduction ratio and I built a worm gear and a worm drive that give me another 50 to 1 reduction ratio. And you can see here the uh, worm gear is uh, held in place by a plastic mount and it gets uh, interleaved against the uh, the turning gear and that gets attached to the brass rod that eventually gets hooked up to the capacitor. And there's always also an end stop switch in there so I can home the uh, device every time it powers on it goes to home so you always know where your zero point is and then you can control it from there. Writing software again uh, I use uh, Visual Studio to write my Arduino software, but you can basically use any tool that you can uh, program the Arduino and then uh, debug it or monitor it over a serial port. So I wrote some software with a very small set of commands like for moving up and down or for going to a certain position or for connecting or disconnecting and, uh, and that came together quite nicely. And the first test on the serial port um, the commands I put in place included a plus uh, 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 key, which basically turns the loop control on and homes the device. And then I can either do uh, a G command or a U or a D command. U or D tells it how many steps it wants to go up or down. Uh, and the G command means go to, so I can say go to 50,000 and it'll, it'll go to that position. And so all, that all worked well and uh, I breadboarded everything and got it working on the breadboard and then decided it's time to move to a printed circuit board. So uh, quite a few less wires lying around. I made a printed circuit board which uh, control uh, contains the control cable attachments, uh, the Arduino and the wireless device and the uh, power hookup for five volts. This whole thing is running off a 5 volt power supply but I could run it off 12 volts as well. The printed circuit board was relatively straightforward uh, and I <coughs> designed it so that I could mount the uh, modules like the Arduino and the wireless device into little pin connectors and I also put some startup jumpers on the control board so uh, without actually changing the software, I can use a jumper in the first the right hand jumper position to say I want you to be uh, wired using the serial port or I want you to be wireless. Uh, the second jumper tells it whether to be a wireless as a station on the network or wireless as, as an access point. And the third jumper is for debugging. It basically uh, reflects all of the activities back over the serial port so you can monitor what's what's going on. And there's a little 3.3 volt uh, <coughs> regulator on there. Um, the uh, motor is driven off uh, 5 volts and the uh, wireless and the uh, wireless is driven off 3.3 and the Arduino is driven off 5 volts. So again, fairly straightforward. Not a hard circuit board to make. This one was made during uh, using the uh, toner transfer method and uh, that's something I've used quite often. Loop performance. Well, does it work? Yes, it does. <laughs> the very first day I had it uh, leaning on the lilac bush. I tuned it by hand to resonance on 10.1 megahertz. Um, I adjusted it for the lowest SWR by basically moving the feed loop slightly up and down. And then I went down to the shack and uh, had a contact with the station. I think it was down in Denver, Colorado on uh, 30 meters. One of the main reasons I built this loop was to give me a 30 meter antenna, which I've, uh, I've never had before. So I've got a couple of demonstration videos now. Um, 
And uh, what these demonstration videos do is uh, the first one shows HF span, uh, which is a uh, spectrum analysis. And you can see the loop's resident point uh, moving across the frequency spectrum as the motor turns the capacitor. So here's an example of the uh, spectrum. Uh, the loop's been fired up now, and you can see the peak down there below 5 megahertz, where it's uh, slowly tuning upwards. You know the capacitor, uh, when the uh, uh, plates are fully enmeshed and you turn, you get very low change in capacitance. But as you get near fully unmeshed, then the frequency changes uh, quickly, or the capacitance changes quickly. You can see now it's up to around, uh, what are we up to, about uh, eight, uh, 8 or 9 kilohertz. You can see that peak moving up and uh, very slowly uh, the resonant point is changing. There we are getting up to, uh, to around uh, 9 megahertz. It's a lot of background noise today that's actually uh, the noise you're seeing as the peak moves is not just signals, it's also our washing machine. <laughs> okay, it's up above uh, 10 megahertz now. Actually, that peak at 10 was WWB. Uh, we've just moved through 30 meters, and the peak continues to move upwards, getting to 12 megahertz now. You can see this is very sharp, and it uh, requires very careful tuning as you uh, move through the spectrum. We're up to about 13 megahertz. It's moving fast now as the capacitance changes quickly with the stepper motor. Getting up to 15 megahertz. And it'll stop just before it gets to, uh, gets to 18. So there's an example of the resonant point. Here's some 20 meter DX now comparing my beam to uh, the loop antenna on 20 meters. Okay, so I've been good to hear again for a long time, no here. I've been more than two years in the last one. And you're fine today. Five and eight. 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 Okay, so there's a demonstration, and uh, I hope you've enjoyed the story. Uh, just to give you a little bit of the uh, of the details on, in terms of uh, the specifications of this loop, uh, the main loop is five foot in diameter. The feed loop is one foot in diameter. Uh, the butterfly capacitor, as constructed now, is about five to sixty picofarads. Uh, I can get the SWR down to below 1.5 to 1 with the uh, feed arrangement that I'm using. And the current frequency range of this loop is roughly 8 to 18 megahertz. Uh, how efficient is this compared to a full-size dipole? Well, they say in theory I should be down less than 1S unit on the three bands that it covers. Uh, I think in actual fact from the testing I've done, it's actually down about 2S units on uh, and uh, bands where I have a tuned antenna, and it's down about 1S unit on bands where I don't really have a tuned antenna. So it works. Uh, I, it doesn't work as well as the theory says, but it does work, and it does give me an antenna on uh, 30 meters. Uh, the remote control specs, uh, yeah, I can use this either wired to a serial port or I can use it wireless. I can run in Wi-Fi as a home network station or as a standalone access point, which means uh, I can actually take this loop anywhere and connect to it with uh, a computer. Uh, gear reduction and worm gear reduction gives me a tuning range of about 50,000 steps, uh, 566 steps for one degree.
and there's automatic uh, homing at startup. And uh, with that number of steps, it's rel relatively straightforward to tune this antenna to the resident point. Now the challenges I have, there's really four of them. The first is backlash on the gear train. Uh, and I think I can probably correct that in software. But what that basically means is the uh, the motor loses its fine tuning when it changes direction because of the slop between the gears. Uh, it's top heavy. It's a five foot loop, and it's not light. And I think if I'm going to have this permanently mounted outside, I'll need some guying as well as the small PVC stand that I built. Uh, need some sort of permanent power supply. I can't use a battery because there's too much current draw, so I'll maybe have to figure out how to send uh, 5 to 12 volts through the coax using a bias T or something like that. And if I want to get 40 meter coverage, I need to add about uh, another 40 puff on the capacitor, which I've got room to do, but I uh, haven't done yet. You can read all about uh, this build on my website, Making It Up. Uh, which is at uh, play.fallows.ca. And uh, in the meantime, enjoy making in ham radio. I certainly do. And uh, there's no end of things you can do with a CNC machine, a, a 3D printer, and a little bit of ingenuity, as well as a whole bag of cheap parts from China. Thank you.